good evening this meeting of the wilson basin school district this school board district number seven school board is called to order at five thirty p m if everybody could stand for the pledge of allegiance Okay, Mrs. Langford, if you'd call the roll. Gent. 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 Wallstead. Yes, here. Williams. Here. Wheeler. Here. Swint. 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 Casmer. Here. Renner. Here. We do have a quorum, so we will proceed. Um, next agenda item would be mission and vision statement. Our mission is to inspire and prepare students for the next level of education, work, and life. Our vision is to foster student growth and build trusting partnerships between students, staff, family, and community. An education at Wilson Basin School District Number 7 will support our students' intellectual, social, and emotional growth. We will provide students with an innovative curriculum supported by various co-curricular activities. The outcome of our efforts will empower students to make a difference in their community and world. We believe in providing a safe environment where healthy relationships and student growth are priorities. So the next agenda item would be um, to adopt agenda. If the board's happy with the agenda, do we have a motion to approve? Mr. Chairman, I'd move to adopt the agenda as presented this evening. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing nothing, Mrs. Langford, will you call the roll? Walstead? Yes. Williams? Yes. Wheeler? Aye. Casmer? Aye. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. Next agenda item would be uh, number three, showcasing schools. We have a, a school presentation by the Coyote Center administration. Hello everyone, my name is Heath Glenn, I'm the lead principal at uh, Wilsdon Middle School Central Campus. With me this evening is Tyler Hazer, he's the 8th grade principal specifically at Coyote Center. So we're going to share with you a little bit of information regarding Coyote Center, which of course is one of the three main centers that's at Central Campus. Uh, both ASB and Bakken Ridge have already been showcased, so now it's Coyote Center's turn. So starting with our enrollment numbers, we're at the point of the year where we're actually gaining and losing a lot of students as families start the transition of what the next chapter might be for individual families. So we have a lot of influx right now in the student population. Um, it, it actually equals out pretty well when you take a look at how many are coming into the district, how many are leaving the district uh, within the 7th and 8th grade. Uh, but when I ran the numbers on April 3rd, in 7th grade we had 283 students and um, in 8th grade we had 281 for a total of 564. Uh, but that number is probably different today just because we see the continual influx this time of year. Uh, that is pretty tight for the, for the building that we're in. We are utilizing the modulars that are on the west side of the middle school outside of the library. We also turned the old shop that was part of the high school when the Bakken was the high school. Uh, that has all been renovated into classrooms as well. So um, we're still trying to use every available inch that we have, but uh, we make do with what we have. If we go on to the next slide, we'll get into a little bit of our testing data. So we've had two benchmark assessments. We had our initial benchmark that we did in the fall, which is where we just kind of gauge where the students at that have come to us. Um, and then we just completed our winter assessment when we get back after Christmas break. So the two uh, uh, scores that we have to look at, you can see there, if you're looking at the top right there, um, if it's in green, green is good, yellow is a little concerning, red is really concerning. Uh, the green is at or above grade level, the yellow is one grade below, and then the red is two or more grades below. As you can see, we're sitting at 43% that are two or more grade levels below where we would like them to be. Um, that is something that we as administrators use when we're making decisions for how are we going to try and combat that? How are we going to shrink that number and move students from the red 
over to the green. What we're looking at here specifically is our math results. I would turn your attention to the bottom left. If you take a look, we can see our comparison from our fall diagnostic to our winter. Uh, I don't think it's any secret that there's a lot of change at Central Campus this year. The merging of the three centers, all new administration, all new systems that we're putting in place, even with all of that change, we're pretty happy with the results with our tier three specifically. These are the students that were multiple grade levels below when we got them in the fall. We've reduced 53% of the students from being two or more be, uh, grade levels behind to 44. Again, that number is not where we want it to be, but this is showing we are making progress even as we're learning about the systems we're trying. We're continually um, tweaking those systems so that they have the biggest impact possible. Um, so. Another good indicator is the tier ones. We increase from 15% of students being in tier one to 24%, um, and our tier two students have stayed stable at 32. So um, again, the, the numbers aren't where we want them, but we are making progress, and we're gonna continue to make progress into the spring and then into next year as we continue to um, evaluate what we're trying to do to get the kids caught up. If we go on to the next slide here, this is gonna be our reading scores. This is a similar story. If we take a look at the top right, uh, green is good. That's uh, on or above grade level. The yellow is where we're getting a little concerned. They're one grade level below, and then the red is the two or more uh, grade levels below. Not as much growth when we look in the comparison here. From the fall to the winter, we only reduced our tier three by 3%. Um, again, it, they're, they're high numbers, not what we want. We're moving in the right direction, but we'd like to pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, and again, that, the only way we do that is by working with the teachers to see what's working in the classroom, what are some new systems we can implement, how can we best get the students that are multiple years behind more intervention time. Uh, ideally, we'd like them to get more one-on-one -on -one time, but we're in a staffing shortage, so we don't have the luxury of having strategists at the middle level right now that can pull the students out work with them one-on-one. -on -one. We're having to do everything in the middle of a class of 20 to 26 students. That's really hard for a teacher to try and divide into three different groups, give students one-on-one -on -one attention while managing the other 20 in the class, but they're doing a fantastic job and we're making progress, but we're gonna continue to evaluate that as we move forward. So if we go to the next one, the big thing that we're doing to combat this is what we call our win time. Win stands for what I need now. So our teachers look at individual student data through the diagnostic, the iReady diagnostic. It gives very specific benchmarks of where students are at. So we don't only look at the overall score of where the student is at, we can dive into the data more and we can pinpoint the exact standards and benchmarks that they're struggling with. So what our teachers do is as a team, they get together and they look at each individual student's data points and then they categorize the students with where do they need the most help. And then within that win time structure, we try to provide direct, in, direct interventions for those students so that they, if they're struggling with standard 1A, just for example, we can give them direct intervention on standard 1A. And then while they're getting direct intervention on 1A, you can still have the other students with some of their standards doing independent work, and it allows the teacher to go from group to group to try and give them some direct intervention. Um, this year we had an extended win time just because of the way that our schedule worked. So for the thir uh, first 35 minutes, what we do is we use an iReady program, which is a computerized program where the students in the fall, they basically take a diagnostic and then the program recognizes what grade level they're at and it creates a pathway for each student so that they can go in and do self-paced lessons. So our teachers are trained in what to look for and how to assign those lessons and how to monitor those lessons. So the first 35 minutes of this win time is completely self-paced student time. The second 35 is where we split them into their tier groups that you saw in the triangle in the, in the previous slides, the tier one, the tier two, and the tier three. And we can provide them more of that teacher-based direct intervention. So we're trying to hit the students in multiple formats and multiple ways while giving them the interventions that they need. 
You have anything to add on the wind time? <laughs> All right, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hazer that's gonna go into some of the successes that we're seeing around Coyote Center. So the first would be the, uh, student, the uh, sorry, North Dakota State Science Fair. We had eight students that qualified for that. Um, that was held this last weekend and we did have a first and third place uh, in the Northwest region that came out of that, out of that uh, competition. So the science kids are working hard and, and we're taking that on the road. Um, in that kind of realm, the TSA, the Technology Student Association, um, they are working right now towards going on that national trip and, and learning those leadership skills at the national level with other students their same age. Um, some other student successes, school successes, we've had three family engagement nights. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity, we have one coming up here at the end that we'll talk about. Um, we've done one housed at every center. Our first one was housed at ASB Center. We did what's called Explore the Core. So we went into the core classrooms and they did a lesson in science and they did a lesson in, in ELA, a lesson in math and a lesson in social studies. Um, families got to take that in as well. Our social studies one, I'm gonna point out specifically, that was our Philippine Culture Showcase. Uh, we have 14 teachers and several ancillary staff at the Central Campus that are J1 Filipino teachers. And so they were able to showcase their, their dancing and their singing, and most of all their food. If you haven't had a chance, you, you need to. Um, the second one was Meet the Author. That was held at Bakken Ridge. Uh, we had a nationally acclaimed author come in, Roland Smith. Uh, he's got multiple books. I think he said 50 books he's written. Um, and he had all of the students during the day, six, seven, and eight. And then he came and had an evening perform or an evening talk with the public and handed out quite a few free books to students. Um, and then we had cookies and coffee after that. And our third one is coming up on the 19th. Uh, the Minot Zoo is coming. Uh, they'll be showcasing their animals. We're also doing some outdoor activities, including they're gonna have a bash the car competition, if you remember that from back when we were in, when I was in high school. Um, we're gonna be doing that sort of thing and a lot of outdoor activities, including uh, food trucks. So if you're not doing anything that night, do come out and, and join us for that. Some other successes, this is another thing that just happened. It's called um, <clears throat> the Able Games. So I'm gonna read a couple things. Um, there's some pictures on, on a different slide, but um, the adaptive PE kids, they work with peer mentors all through, throughout the year. And um, Coyote Center chose to not necessarily pick those kids that are our top flyers in academics or our top flyers in behavior, but those kids that really wanted to work with these students. And so this is the first time we've attended as a team from Williston to the ABLE Games. Um, again, we were able to get a first and second place finish at that event. But I more importantly wanna read some things that came from uh, Ms. Willardson specifically about this event. Um, she said, my students got to experience what it feels like to be valued and participating part of a team with their peers. Uh, another thing she said is their parents got to see them make meaningful connections with their peers. One time a student's mom got to see two peer mentors give knucks on his way into school. He'd had a difficult morning and this student and his mom both teared up and ex she expressed how special it was to see her student greeted as a friend and a colleague. Um, when another student got to the event this weekend, he lit up when he saw and recognized his team members, his peer mentors, and his mom was tearful and was excited to see them. And one other is she saw the peer mentors, that's the kids that we picked, handpicked for this event, um, know that sometimes it's frustrating for their teachers. They struggle with, with their academics, they struggle with their behavior, but it gave them a place to shine and in her words, did they ever shine. So that was a great thing for our school. There's a whole presentation coming out, so watch, we'll get it to Paula and she'll get it out, but watch for that with the pictures and all that. I do wanna highlight the music department. Um, since COVID, music departments across the state have been, been really struggling to get people involved in those. Um, we have currently uh, 110 kids in our orchestra program, six through eight. We have uh, 70, roughly 70 kids in our choir program. Um, we have not been over 60 since COVID happened and about 200 in our band program. So we're really growing that six, seven, eight program. A lot of music kids involved. We're also um, adding two different, or excuse me, um, elective classes. One is six through eight world music. So they get to work with drumming and those types of things. And the other one is six through eight guitar. And both of those have been really fun for those sixth graders to start to get their hands on some of those musical instruments. The next slide, we're making a lot of improvements. Um, we talked a lot about this. I mean, some things, that we've got are new cafeteria tables. You might not think cafeteria tables make a big difference, but when they're sitting in a circle in a chair, their behaviors are different than when they're sitting on a, their own spot on a rectangle table. Mm. Uh, it just, it, it's different. Um, the new classroom desks, some of those desks were around since the high school was brand new, so we were able to get that done. Uh, new teacher desks, again, some of those really heavy old desks that the teachers were using. 
Some other things that were important, we've done the safety improvements. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about that. We're making sure that our building is safe and as much as we absolutely can at all times. We've done some aesthetic, aesthetic improvements. Um, the entryways are all less hospital and more inviting. Um, all of our environments are like that. Um, and then we've done some improvements like painting the bathrooms. It makes a difference the environment they walk in. Um, if the walls are covered in cover-up spray paint, it makes a difference if, if it has a fresh coat of paint, they're more likely to take care of what they have in front of them. So we've done some of those things as well. Mr. Glenn. Now, if we could stay on this slide for just a second, I have to give a shout out to the district's maintenance crew. That far right window there, that is the upgraded, what we call the Lotus Lounge. This is going to be a student-run cafe style. Uh, we've worked with um, our food services director to make sure that everything the students are going to prepare and sell, it meets the state uh, food guideline requirements. Um, so that's a brand new wall cut in the middle of a space with a beautiful counter, a roll down window. The students are going to just love it. They installed a sink and plumbing in this room where there was no other water access. Uh, we got an ice machine back there and all of that came from maintenance. So I do have to give a shout out if you see our maintenance people around. They, they're doing great work around Central Campus. I know that it was a point that we wanted to try and beautify Bakken a little bit more. It's one of the oldest buildings in the district and they've been doing everything that we ask. They don't argue. They just say we can get it done. And this is an example of the, the good work that they do. So I just wanted to give them a shout out. If we continue on here, uh, Central Campus, along with many other uh, schools in the district, we are piloting some new programs. So I'm proud that the teachers have bought into some of these new programs. As, as admin, we've really embraced these new programs. One of the biggest one is the BAR program, which is building assets, reducing risk. We're particularly excited about this because the middle school has had a system built in known as Team Time since the middle school opened in 2004. And I know Team Time existed when it was the old junior high school uh, across from St. Joe's. What this does is it gives our core teachers and then electives, if they're on that team, it gives them time built into their daily schedule where they get to meet as a collective team and they get to discuss student academics, student behaviors. This is where we develop our intervention plans to correct behaviors, uh, to try and, um, and come up with academic interventions. If students aren't motivated, we can see what's working in Mr. Glenn's class because it's not working in Mr. Hazer's class. Well, Mr. Hazer tried this because it was working in my <laughs> class. Um, and BAR is all about that built-in time. So one of the things when the bar coaches were here, uh, they were very excited with Central Campus because we already have that time built in. So we're a step ahead of most schools that are trying to implement this system. Um, our teachers in particular, they're excited about the bar program uh, because it gives structure to those team times and it focuses not only on academics or behavior, but both at the same time. And it gives us guidance in some of the interventions that we're gonna be implementing uh, starting in the fall of next year. So we're really excited about that. I know the district is moving to the bar program district-wide when we get back in the fall, uh, but we've been able to get a head start the other one that we're excited to have, although we've, we've had some mishaps with, is our Raptor Alert System, which is meant to get everybody informed and everybody on the same page as quickly as possible. You know, we've got three, three centers on campus. They're interflowing all the time, trying to make sure that information is released in an efficient manner and accurately released is of paramount importance. Uh, we have made a couple mistakes, which we fully admit to. It's a new program, we're learning it, but I think as we continue to um, use it and get accustomed to it, uh, give us just a little bit more time and this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a good thing, not only for us on campus, but for the community as a whole, because it adds transparency to what's happening inside the buildings. And then the other one, uh, teacher retention is a, is a big concern right now. As we all know, we're losing lots of teachers. Uh, the district has brought in a company, Vital Network. Uh, their sole purpose is to improve the teacher's experience uh, to reduce the burnout that they experience and hopefully allow us 
to retain them. They do this through mostly um, surveys. A lot of teachers, they don't like coming to myself or Mr. Hazer because they think there's going to be retaliation or they think that their evaluations might be affected by it. This program right here, it's all anonymous. We don't see any teacher names. We don't, it's not connected to a single person, rather as a collective group. So as a group, we can break it down between Coyote Center, we can break it down between Bach and Ridge, ASB, we can isolate and triangulate the results we're getting so that we know what are the specific concerns of staff in each of the three centers so that we can better address it. Because the concerns at ASB might not be the same concerns at Coyote Center or vice versa, et cetera. Um, so we're really excited. We've had some good results that have come back from Vital Network already. Uh, Vital Network's been good in bringing their people to us to help us uh, understand the data that they collect and how we can best use it. So we're excited to continue our partnership with them. Two things on that really quick. Vital Network, um, unlike others that you take a survey and move on, was often what we do in our culture. They're going to come with skills for us, things to work on in our specific areas that we're low in. So it's not just take a survey and move on and see how you're doing. It's also how are we going to fix those things because retention is huge. We literally cannot hire enough teachers, brand new teachers into this profession to keep up with the people that are leaving. And then quickly on BAR, it sounds like it's just another acronym, but we're noticing that Everything that BAR does, we're already doing. We're just putting new language and new uh, systems in place with what we're already working on. So it's not the newest thing, it's just new language for what we're already doing. And it provides, uh, it provides enhanced structure to what we're already doing, which is exciting for us because it gives us that blueprint, but it also will add consistency across campus. All right, if we continue on here, uh, some difficulties that we've had. We all have difficulties. Uh, one of our big ones on campus, of course, is the, the staff shortage. Uh, that includes subs. There's not enough subs in the district. On any given day, we're probably eight, nine subs short on campus. That's all three centers combined. So our teachers have been amazing, and they go and they sub on their off hours so that there's still a, a certified teacher in the room. A lot of times, uh, if, if there's a history teacher that's off, they'll try to go sub a history classroom so that it's a little bit more meaningful. Even though there's a sub, they can still get some of the content enrichment piece. Uh, but that also takes a toll on teachers because now they're giving up prep times. They're going to have to grade and plan after work rather than during work. Um, so as we get to the final stretch here of the school year, we're starting to see that it's starting to take its toll a little bit, and that's concerning to Mr. Hazer and I because we don't want them to burn out with a couple weeks left to go because those, those last couple weeks oftentimes are the most important weeks to end on a good note. Um, so that's been a difficulty. If we look at next year's vacancies at Central Campus, we're already over 25, most of which are certified teaching positions. So what we're doing already is we're talking about contingency plans. What are we going to do if we can't get enough in so that we can provide the best educational experience for all of our students? Um, we've got some moving parts in the administration next year. New administrations already working with current administration on developing these contingency plans, getting systems put in place um, so that we're not caught off guard. We're going to be prepared for whatever whatever we come with in the fall in August, we're going to be ready to go. Whether it's a full staff, whether it's 20 vacancies, we'll, we'll be ready. But it is a difficulty that we are facing. Uh, and then lastly, just kind of the future at Central Campus. We're pretty excited about what we're doing. Like I said, we're having a little bit of administrative changes that are coming in. Uh, we've met as a new administrative group. We're very excited for the people that we're going to be working with. All of us still bring our unique strengths to the table. We're learning how to best put everybody in the best possible place for success and to lean on each other's strengths. Um, but we are going to rework kind of how we did things this year. We learned a lot from this year. Um, so we're going to take, okay, this really didn't work, so this is how we're going to rework it for next year. Um, and everybody seems to be on the same page and excited to rework kind of that system. Uh, the full bar implementation, we got trained on bar this year, next year in the fall. We're a little bit luckier than some of the other schools in the district that are going to go through the bar training in the fall. We get a jump right in right away in the fall. So we're excited about that. Uh, with the bar implementation is the student supports. We're hoping to get our strategists back that can pull the students and work more closely with them. We're also adopting what's known as behavior academies because behaviors are, are widespread since COVID. Uh, so we've been getting some professional development from a nationally 
uh, renowned company, Solution Tree, and uh, what's known as the RTI process and the RTI at work process. We're going to be uh, implementing that. That goes right in with BAR, which we're excited about, so we're not having to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then, of course, just from the teacher standpoint, from the admin standpoint, just continuous improvement, all of us working together. One of the things that we're most appreciative from the admin point is um, the willingness of the staff for new admin to come in and all of us really being on the same playing field, the same level, working together to do the best we can with what we, uh, what we have this year. So that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, we're happy to, uh, to address any of it. Board members, do you have any questions? Thank you. You bet. You guys are doing a good job. Um, so the red numbers of students who are behind, mm -hmm. um, what's your theory? Do you have a theory, theory as to why there's so many behind? I don't want to put you guys on the spot. <laughs> uh, we, we've been low in the district before. We mm -hmm. know that. Um, COVID did not help matters. Mm -hmm. We know nationally, uh, all the articles that I've been reading is that nationally COVID kept a, a good chunk of students about a year and a half to two years behind. Particularly the students that school isn't their most exciting thing in the world. Uh, they go more because they have to, not because they want to. Well, during COVID, if you didn't want to be at school, you didn't want to, you know, you had to take a lot of initiative as a student to get yourself up in front of the computer every day to do all the assignments that were being assigned. Um, so COVID definitely played a role, but I'm not using COVID as an excuse. I mean, we, we were lower before COVID, uh, but that certainly didn't help. Uh, I think that a lot of the behaviors that we're dealing with since COVID are affecting the academic performance. I think if we can get a good handle on our behaviors, then the academic piece is going to follow. That's why um, we've been really, really excited with our professional development from the admin level this year, getting trained in behavior academies, getting trained in the different interventions that we can do, uh, because we've kind of taken the stance that if we get a control of the behaviors, academics is going to fall in place. But if the behaviors are out of controls, you can't expect the kids to learn when there's all the disruptions and just chaos. Yeah. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but no, that's it does. kind of my take. Yeah, no, it, do, it does completely. And I, I've read a lot of the st statistics, and I know that there is a significant correlation between these um, negative behaviors and education. And we do have a larger percentage of uh, students in all grades um, that have got some more significant behavior issues. Um, and there's a lot of theories as to why that is. COVID is one of them. Um, so it's kind of a like a dartboard. <laughs> yeah, and just throw the dart and, and pick the style. And nationally, we're losing more teachers because of mm -hmm. student behavior and struggles in the classroom and burnout than we are. Um, it used to be administration was the biggest reason teachers were leaving. They were tired of administration, as Dr. <laughs> Bailey, you've been around, you know. Uh, but that has shifted since COVID uh, on the exit interviews nationwide, not just Wilston, not just North Dakota. A lot of teachers, there's more teachers now that are saying it's the, the student behavior issues that they're just getting burnt out. They don't feel like we have enough staff in place. There's not enough support in place. Um, so that that's something that we're looking forward to finding solutions to because if we can help support on the behavioral level the academics will fall into police uh, police into place teachers will feel supported hopefully it reduces the burnout and we can keep our our teachers yep now <coughs> schools mm -hmm. uh, our school well, focus on our school we only have students a certain percentage of each day um, certain percentage of time during that day what can be done to help with the behaviors? So I said the same, I, uh, I'm going to give the same answer that I gave when, when did we do our presentation Monday? Mm -hmm. Last week Monday we did yep. our, our uh, public presentation um, and I made a statement that was we have to get better as a community with schools and parents partnering, not being at odds against each other, not pointing figure, uh, fingers that it's the parents' fault, no, it's the teacher's fault. We got to get rid of that. You know, I was fortunate enough that I grew up here in Williston and I was proud to be a Williston grad. I got a good education. Williston gave me a good education that I was able to take with me and I'm back now because of it. Um, but the community atmosphere back when I was going to school versus now was night and day difference. There was a lot more, it's a community effort back then. Mm -hmm. Now we've gotten to all the, all the bickering, all the finger pointing. 
we got to put that aside and we got to work with our parents and our parents have to work with us and we got to reinstill the trust there. There's, there's a lot of trust and a lot of hurt that's there and we're trying to do our part at our level with trying to mend some of that but until we can mend that it's going to be a bumpy road but I think we got to get back to that community feel. Okay. Speak to that as well. Yes please. So from an outsider's perspective I'm not from here but I've been here for since COVID and I've asked my teachers this in the last five years no year has been like the last right mm -hmm. like when you, if you were a teacher for 30 years you pretty much knew it was coming at you when you came in the doors at the beginning of the year last five years no fault of their own no year has been like the last so dr Faley and the district office have decided that we're going to really focus on these two things the vital network and the bar program and we're going to get these systems locked down and in place which will help with the behaviors because if we're all using the same language we all have the same systems in place across k through 12 it's going to help with some of those behaviors might take a minute but we'll get there okay okay all right i, I thank you both I, I thank you for being candid and um you know allowing me to put you on the spot for a minute um you know another piece to that is um outside of school you know the the structure and the ability to access things outside of school uh, helps also. It's that, that village effect. It's not just the school, it's, it's the home, it's the community, it's the community leaders and the parents all working together. Yep, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Wheeler. Board members, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just had some from my notes. Um, you know, I just wanted to tell you guys, thank you for recognizing the biggest struggles within your teachers and your students and your parents, right? Because at the end of the day, they're all coinciding together. Um, and to Mrs. Wheeler's point, when I was growing up, the saying was always, it takes a village. And those communities really took a hold of that in the sense of if somebody was at a basketball game misbehaving, you know, those parents would step in even without that child being theirs, right? And I think you see kind of a disconnect going on in this world now where it's kind of to each their own. Um, and that's kind of shown this effect, I would say, of um, not entitlement to a point, but just kind of no fear of consequences. And that rolls into school, that rolls into playing at the arc, that rolls into playing at parks, right? And we see that all the time in our community and it's not just here, it's across the United States. Um, so really focusing on the bar and the vital network is key, not only to help your your teachers, because it is true, um, you know, when you talk to teachers now from even 20 years ago, they knew what they were kind of walking into 20 years ago every classroom session right it wasn't like what's going to happen today and it's almost like this anxiety that comes with teaching anymore that didn't used to exist they had lesson plans they knew what they were doing and again that that isn't just to Williston that's nationwide um, where it's more behavioral issues where they feel more like counselors social workers and they didn't go to school for that you know and so it is overwhelming for them I was reading an article the other day for North Dakota um, and it said that the our teacher age has dropped by 12 for, or 12 years of when people are um, leaving the profession. It used to be 54 and it's 42 now. Um, and that's been in the last five years and steadily dropping. Um, and like you guys said, it's due to behavior issues. It's due, it's not necessarily due to, it used to be if people left a profession, it was due to leadership. And in this profession, it's not, you know, and I'm not here to blame parents and I'm not here to blame kids, but it is different variables that are now involved in why our teachers are leaving. And they're not even leaving, leaving for higher paying jobs. They're leaving for jobs that are less chaotic. They're leaving for jobs that don't put so much on their plate um, in the sense because they take their jobs so seriously that having a child quote unquote fail in their classroom or not behaving correctly, they take that personally. As, as every teacher should, right? Because they are the ones in front of them. But again, it's a different day and age. And I don't like to blame COVID either, but I do always remember that these students that we're seeing in high school, that we're seeing in, in the central campus, even third, fourth graders, those kids were highly affected by COVID. And that aspect is not going to go, to go away. It's only been a couple years since that happened. And it's gonna take time for that to kind of go out of their system. And you know, I, I applaud you guys for all that you're trying to do, the things, the tools that you're bringing in, um, because it's not easy and we're not even close to the finish line, but the finish line looks better when you have tools in place to help the people that are struggling. And it's not just the teachers, parents are struggling as well. Um, and so I just, you know, again, appreciate you guys doing the parent engagement night. You know, that gives people a chance to 
not just come in and learn about their children's behaviors or grades, but to showcase your school, showcase what you guys bring to the table. And I think that's so important to make it fun, you know, because it is so heavy sometimes in schooling right now. Um, and I do want to say that as, as what you guys are saying, there is this disconnect of, of finger pointing. Um, you know, when kids are at school, that's your responsibility. When kids are at home, that's your responsibility. When really they all have to coincide in order to have a really good system for that student to know that both sides are working together and are holding them accountable to not just good behaviors, but to want to get them good grades, right? And, you know, hopefully that this, we'll see this kind of, this disconnect bridge together here in the next few years but you know I applaud you guys for doing that also I just wanted to tell you the peer mentors I mean that just makes me smile I mean when kids feel a part of something that they typically are kind of left out of or feel disengaged to um, how important for them to feel that they're part of the the, the, I don't know, majority or whatever you want to call it. And for also those kids that are stepping up to help those kids, um, it shows other people what they're willing to do. Um, it shows other kids that may not be as kind or as accepting that, you know, that's not normal behavior and they're the, they're the minority in that situation. So just amazing job you guys are doing over there. You've got a lot of work. I know that is on your plate at all times, um, but you guys are doing a great job. We see you, we appreciate you. And you know, thank you guys for always being willing to look at you know, the things that haven't worked so well and being able to adjust those because that's just as important as making changes is knowing when changes aren't the best or haven't worked out the best. So you know, thank you guys for your leadership. And like I said, we see you and we really do appreciate you and your teams and looking forward to seeing what you're gonna do next year. Um, like Mrs. Wheeler kind of already hit on the math. So you know, thank you for that. I won't hammer that home, but you're fully aware you know, and you're fully aware of what needs to be looked at. And what we, I look forward to seeing those numbers improve, you know, because any improvement is improvement. So thank you guys. Thank you. Mr. Glenn and Mr. Hazer, your enthusiasm is evident and I appreciate um, it's contagious. And, and I love the excitement that you guys bring. I applaud the successes and celebrate the successes with both of you. Um, thank you for being on the front lines with our students and our, and our staff. Appreciate that very, very much. We know it's a difficult task. Um, I appreciate the way you addressed addressed the community. Uh, it is easy to find fault, isn't it? And I also appreciate that when you're coming up here tonight and you're showing us the uh, the tier one, tier two, tier three. I'm sure that's not where you want it to be. And I appreciate your vulnerability standing up here and letting us see the raw data tonight. And you've already addressed, I think where your heart is, and that's what I'm concerned with. You, you have a platform before students all the time through the school year. If you had a platform with parents of the students, the parents that are tired and exasperated and just don't know what to do, what would you guys like to say to parents? I, I would tell them just, just reach out to us and let's sit down and let's meet about what you're experiencing at home, what we're experiencing at, experiencing at school and let's come up with a game plan to, to monitor the successes at home and the successes at school, and we can uh, definitely come up with a plan together. Um, unfortunately, you know, administration, we usually are the disciplinarians, and I can't tell you how many times um, parents have come in, and once they realize that you're on, you want what the parent wants. You want children to be successful. You want the students to be successful. Um, and if you approach it in the fact that I'm here to work with you, to get the result that we both want, um, the demeanor changes almost immediately, and it's actually kind of powerful uh, when when you form that bridge, and rather than the anger, resentment towards each other, now we're gonna put our energies together, and we've been able to make some pretty good impacts with some pretty difficult situations, I would say. Uh, but that's what I tell parents is if you're struggling at home, like we are a resource. Don't be afraid to reach out to us. And I can understand the hesitation. That's a, that's a vulnerable place to be. You know, I, I'm struggling with my students at home. I, that's a hard, you know, to put yourself out there and say, I, I want you to come in and let's work on this together. What can we do? Um, but that's what I would tell them. Reach out to us, schedule, schedule an appointment with us. We'll sit down with anyone and because that's what we're here for. Mr. Hazer, do you have a comment I, on that? I do. Um, at the end of the year here, the admin are getting together and we're doing a, something called Crucial Conversations. We're doing a training on how to do that. And I'm about to write my own book on that on that exact topic because <laughs> I have I would tell any parent that's angry at me, it's okay to be angry at me and come talk to me. 
I prefer face to face. It's just so much easier to talk face to face with a person than it is on on any type of text or even over the phone. But if you don't have time, I don't have time. Let's have a phone call. Let's have this out because you're mad at me and you're not going to get less mad at me by not coming to me, right? So come talk to me. Let's have a conversation. We, we'll find some sort of resolution, I promise. It might not be exactly what you want. It might not be exactly what you think is needed at that moment, but we will find a resolution. And almost always, this, the saddest thing for me is when kids look at me, they break down in tears because we tell them, this whole team in this room cares about you. And they're like, I didn't think anybody cared. So that's, that's a powerful moment, so. Well, I applaud you for everything you're doing. Hardest thing in the world is for you to stand up there and say, hey, we got a problem here. But it takes a lot of moxie to say, but here's how we're going to fix it. And I applaud the way you're coming up here and telling us how you're going to fix the problems we have. And I think it's very, very important that the public knows that we're all working to make every child a success. It might look different for each child, but we want to make everybody a success. And we're working to get everybody, every every child, a chance to go out there and make a living and make a good citizen for themselves. And I'm very happy that you are showing us that you have a plan. And I thank you very much. Mr. Glenn, you talked about strat not having maybe no strategists or not enough. Is that, I'm assuming that's because they're having the substitute teach. Is no, we actually were short staffed. So we made the decision that we pulled our strategists into the core classroom content. Uh, we, as a group, figured that that was probably more relevant, more meaningful. I mean, I, those are bad words, but there's no other words to say it. Yeah. Um, we would love to be fully staffed and move our strategists back into their strategist position. So if anybody knows of any teachers that want a job, we got, they can choose whatever they want. We got an opening. Uh, but that's how we ended up there was at the, as we came down into crunch time, as we approached August, we took a look at our, our rosters and, you know, we need to fill the core classes, take precedent. Uh, that's where the bulk of the information is presented and the learning happens. Um, so as a group, we just, prioritize that and unfortunately our strategists had to go into the core core classrooms I see mr. Hazer you talked about uh, community family engagement do you feel you get good turnout at those events um honestly no I wish we could get a lot more I and mean, when we have 1700 kids on campus we'd like to see several hundred families there and and the ones that come are very engaged and and they take something away from it every time but no I would like to see a lot more people there we're, we're ready for more so and we even offer free food. And that's still done, Gail. <laughs> uh, well, I was just going to say, even though you know the achievement scores maybe aren't where we all would like to see them, there certainly is a lot of growth there. So we thank you for that and to your staff for that. Board members, is there any other comments or questions? OK, thank you, guys. Thank you. OK, next agenda item. We are on to monitoring school district operations 4A. Uh, do we have a motion to approve operational expectation three treatment of community stakeholders? Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the report as reasonable interpretation with sufficient, sufficient indicators. Okay, we have a motion. Second. We got a second. Discussion? I just wanted to tell Dr. Fadley and his team, um, you know, I, I read through this a few times because this is so important in anything that we're do, doing, regardless of if it's increasing math scores, anything like that, um, that we have to be able to let the people know that they're just as important as the staff, as the board, as, as, as you, um, to that commitment of anything that we're trying to achieve as a district. And that has to be done with a lot of behavioral things that sometimes aren't easy when you're disagreeing in certain situations. So this is all very um, what I would like to see, which is, you know, professionalism, courtesy, and service 
oriented. Um, so thank you guys for taking such a deep dive into that and it, I think it represents exactly what I'm looking for when it comes to community engagement. Dr. Fadley, I also want to recognize that you and the team that scribed all of these, it's a monumental task and a lot of time, a lot of time, I have no doubt. And just want to thank you for the, the time and effort given to these. Board members, any other comments? Okay, hearing nothing, Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll. Williams? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Kasmer? Aye. Walstead? Yes. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. Next agenda item would be 4B, approve results to health and physical education. What's the board's wishes here? Motion to accept the report as a reasonable interpretation with sufficient indicators. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing nothing, Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll. Wheeler? Aye. Kasmer? Aye. Walstead? Yes. Williams? Aye. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. Next agenda item would be 4C, approve results to career and technical education. What's the board's wishes here? Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the report as reasonable with interpretations for sufficient indicators. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Hearing nothing, Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll. Kasmer? Aye. Walstead? Yes. Williams? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. Next section, matters reserved for board action. Um, we have a, a purchase agreement to approve the, the, for a letter of intent to purchase the land out at Granite Peak. Um, this has been reviewed by the district's attorney. What's the board's wishes here? I'll move to accept the letter of intent. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Walstead. Uh, yeah, again, uh, Vogel Law Firm has reviewed this uh, this letter of intent. So is there any questions or discussion? Okay, hearing nothing, Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll. Walstead? Yes. Williams? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Kasmer? Aye. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. Next agenda item would be approve the purchase agreement with the City of Williston. What's the board wishes here? Motion to approve the purchase agreement as presented with the City of Williston. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded. Uh, just again, this, this uh, agreement has been reviewed, reviewed by Vogel Law Firm. So is there any discussion on this item? Okay, hearing nothing, Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll. Williams? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Kasmer? Aye. Walstead? Yes. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> Next agenda item would be to discuss and approve the location for the potential new elementary school. And we have Mr. Lippert here to, to talk about both sites, uh, the pros and cons of each site. You can answer any questions you guys might have. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Nick Lippert, JLG Architects. Uh, thanks for having me again tonight. Uh, exciting night to start thinking about um, some pass forward on uh, a potential location for the uh, hopeful new uh, elementary school for the the district here going forward. 
So um, earlier, uh, we were able to put together some preliminary budgetary numbers for each one of the sites. Um, again, I'll be blatantly honest, uh, neither site has been designed. Um, there's, there's initial concepts of what each site could host and roughly apples to apples between the two in function, size, scale of what we're looking at um, for each site. However, they do come with some different caveats to that, right? So in no particular order, again, reminder, site A, uh, the one just east of uh, um, uh, Sportsman's Warehouse, call it the Granite Peak site. Um, site B, Williston Square site, the old airport, um, just off of 16th. So when we're looking at these, there really came down to three main um, cost factors within the, within the um, looking at each one of the, the project sites. Um, so one being site purchase. Uh, the site A, Granite Peak site, currently um, within in the agreement uh, was coming at no cost to the district, which is fantastic. Um, uh, as compared to Site B, Wilson Square is coming at approximately $1.2 million or $1.2 million uh, for, for that site itself. But there's also a couple other things that I wanna, I wanna point out that does start tilting some tables, right, for consideration. Um, off street uh, site construction, or off site street construction. So uh, what that means is essentially off, um, not included on the 14 acres, there's gonna to need to be some street construction that gains access to either, either one of the sites, right? Um, site A, Granite Peak, we're looking at roughly 725 feet, give or take, at this point of, of street construction. And when we're talking street, we're looking at city section, um, uh, sidewalk to sidewalk, street trees, um, and some potential utilities underneath those. The ranges we've been um, reported, again, range between um, uh, roughly 1,300 to say 1,700, um, in some case 1,750 a foot, a linear foot of that street. So again, that, that roughs out um, to between 942,000 to 1. Uh, yeah, $1.2 million within the Granite Peak site itself. Infrastructure costs, that's additional to that. So that might be some extraneous, um, well, not extraneous, but other additional um, uh, uh, infrastructure pieces. For specific at Granite Peak site, we're expecting to have to construct a regional sanitary sewer line um, as part of this development of this specific piece of property. Um, it would uh, uh, run from the north to the s south end of the site. Um, and again, we're estimating for, based on some uh, city estimates uh, between 600 and 700,000 for that sanitary sewer line. If we look, turn our attention back to Wilson Square site, um, we're talking about the off-site street construction. Again, we're anticipating construction of roughly 560 feet of street. It's actually extending of 13th north off of 33rd to gain access to our site, also gain access to some of the city infrastructure that's up there as well. And that's gonna range uh, preliminary looking at 728,000 to 980,000 for that 560 feet again cities, um, city utilities, uh, sidewalk to sidewalk, um, street trees, um, what would be required in that Wilson Square area. So what that would place, again, that Granite Peak site, um, again, round numbers between 1.5 mil and 1.9 million for the site A, and then again, range at site B between 1.9 million and 2.18, so 2.2 million uh, for that. So Wilson Square, again, is trending to be a more expensive option at this point in time. However, again, they, they, they generally overlap a little bit of what's happening. So that's just one piece of the conversation. Is there any comments on that? Okay. So that's just one piece of the conversation, the cost of this. So there's also a lot of things, right? When everybody's looking at a house or a location for new business, it's location, 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 right? Of, of those other things. We looked at some others and really just kind of comparing A to B. A lot of them are very close between, but I'll start with the top. We looked at vehicular access. So things like how efficient and effective is it to get in and out of the site? Um, both have good amenities uh, and an actual arterial access to them. However, I think the edge is probably going towards a Wilson Square site in the sense that we're not actually using those arterial squares for turning on and off of our site. So for example, on the, on the location A, we would actually have to be turning off of 11th um, in a turn lane that may create some traffic concerns uh, overall. I will also preface to say we are expecting to have a um, uh, traffic study done if the MON moves forward on, e on whatever site's looking at here. So I'd say give the slight edge to Wilson Square because we're actually using secondary streets to access in and out of that site. Provides a little bit of, um, a, a little bit of uh, kind of queuing space not on the main arterial road um, going forward. Pedestrian access, 
again, another big one uh, for any school, uh, no matter whether it be a high school or elementary school, uh, pedestrian access is important. Both sites have pedestrian routes, both um, currently installed trails and sidewalks that would bring access to the site. Um, uh, and currently installed also future plans for them. So future development, both on the trail side and sidewalk side. However, if we look at it kind of myopically, right now um, the, the tables have to tilt again to the Wilson Square site because they're just that much more connected within the existing infrastructure and neighborhoods that are there at that point. Good, either way, good safe pedestrian access on either site. Zoning, it's horse apiece, uh, both, both zoning areas or both sites would be allowed to build a school, elementary school with a little bit of um, rezone uh, needed, but nothing that would, that would tilt, the, tilt the tables either way. There is one, however, with a replat process. Uh, the Wilson Square site, we are anticipating to take more time, roughly six to seven months, to go through a replatting process at the city um, versus the Granite Peak site, which uh, would be um, probably within maybe two to three months worth of that time. I will say on the bigger picture, not a huge bearing on the duration of the project, unless we were trying to get something done this fall potentially, that could be um, a little bit of a hiccup to be able to actually start moving dirt this fall if, if the opportunity arose. But in the big picture, not the end of the world. And then if we're looking at, okay, we're looking at kind of the future aspects of, of these sites going forward. Um, school boundaries is a big one. I, I've been understanding that the districts had initiative to find out catchment areas and boundaries of these of the schools. And I think that's an important conversation to the districts looking at going forward. Um, we, I did have a conversation with um, Rob Schwartz, uh, our, with RSP and Associates about this, and he has a good strong understanding of where those, where the kind of pockets, hot pockets within the community of those students are located. Um, right now, uh, the Wilson Square site fits better within those enrollment needs today. That being said, he was clear to point out that um, the, the uh, site A site, um, the Granite Peak site, does have a good opportunity for catchment west, right? And we know our community is growing west and students are traveling in from that end of the, end of the community. So that is important note to, and I think proves the fact that it is still a good site for a school. But right now where the enrollment is within the community and also for future flexibility, for example, if those boundary areas needed to shift for whatever reason, that centrally located within the community is gonna be an easier way for those boundary areas to shift around it versus something that's on the edge. So a um, little bit of, so I think the edge is probably a little bit towards Wilson Square site having um, a little bit more flexibility there in the long run. And lastly, we looked at future development. Now this is a little bit of a crystal ball work, right? But we all know elementary schools, when they're constructed, um, the development shortly follows after that. And both locations have plans for future development, both commercial, both residential. Um, and uh, again, I think both sites are very excited about what that could bring for attention into these areas. Um, I think uh, the, the again, how do, you, how do you tip that scale a little bit? I think, again, the Willison Square site has the ability to have those, those potential houses, either multifamily, single family um, locations directly adjacent to the site. Um, whereas, again, the, the location for the Granite Peak site is located a little bit more in a commercial area, would have to cross some major traffic routes to be able to get some safe, safe access to those. So those are the areas that we looked at, um, uh, vehicular access, pedestrian access, zoning, replatting process, uh, school boundaries, and future development. And I think by if you total all those up, the Wilson Square site starts, again, both sites would work great for a school, but that's, if we had to pick between the two, that, I think that was the one that is probably rising to the top. Any questions? I'll stop there, take a breath. Mr. Renner, may I just add one point of clarification? Yep. Yep. Great question. Yep. So the, que the question question was about um, essentially what was planned in the overall five to fifty five million project budget. We had two million fifty thousand planned for site acquisition and uh, infrastructure development on a site. That's what we had planned. Um, so I think either site uh, would be within that project budget or would be able to be made within that project budget regardless of what we're looking at. So we had planned for an investment, either that be upfront cost or, or um, infrastructure development, either way. Thank you for that clarification. Board members, do you have any questions for Mr. Lippert? 
I've got a question. I know that you've heard the same that we've heard. 55 million is, mm -hmm. is a hard number, yep. right? It's a hard number from the times that we've talked about other bonds. Um, but I've heard you guys also talk about how you, you're going to be looking for cost-effective mm -hmm. ways throughout the process. Yep. Um, can you just dive in a little bit deeper for me, for the public, yeah. on how you guys are going to do that? Does it differentiate between each site of what you think you could save or all That's that kind of question. stuff? I think initially um, looking at either site um, and, and the site costs included within the general construction of what we're looking at, I think would roughly be apples to apples. We do have a little bit, again, so probably a little bit more grading. Uh, we, we don't necessarily have geotechnical information on either site. However, the reports that we've been given from both of the owners suggest we shouldn't have anything unexpected. That would be my first thing. It's like, are we going to find something we can't build on on each one of the sites? Um, and the second thing that um, we'd be looking at uh, for each one of the sites uh, really is, is how much coordination can we get from either community, city, parks, um, wh whomever around the community to help use those. And I think that if we're looking at it from a site perspective, that's where our best opportunity for savings are, is some of the extraneous development around the building itself. I don't think the selection either one would impact the budget overall um, of what we're looking at, roughly apples to apples that way. Um, and then I guess if we look inside the building, maybe to take a next step, or maybe I'll stay on the site a little bit. Some of the other things on the site um, that we could look at is obviously paving alternates of, um, you know, concrete versus asphalt. Um, is there any opportunities for, um, you know, right-sizing parking areas? Are they something that, again, between uh, staff and, and public parking areas, is there anything that can be alternates as well um, that can be brought into the project in future, planned for now, but brought into the project in the future. So those will all be things we'll be talking about on the site. Um, within the building, uh, the biggest one is square foot. If um, at that dollar per square foot, everyone we save is going to be significant uh, savings. So we're going to be looking at right-sizing those spaces, um, making sure we got classrooms where we need them, um, making sure, uh, you know, all the way down to the gym of making sure that that, that those spaces are right sized. After that, looking at building systems. So right now we're planning on a precast and steel structure um, for the building, which is durable. It's probably the quickest to market as far as getting it stood up and getting it completed. Um, and durability is second to none. But there's also other ways to make that happen, right? With different wall systems that we're, we're currently exploring of how that can happen. Um, and then on top of that, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to um, uh, you know, technology and in integration within the building, making sure we're planning for what's right, not over planning, right? It's easy to do that, thinking, oh, we can just add some power here and add some data here, and, and it, it adds up over time. Um, and then uh, another big one is, we were just talking in the back, is um, grant opportunities is a, a, a very large one, both on technology, furniture, um, kitchen equipment, um, uh, playground equipment. All, all of those uh, grant opportunities here would be, be net negatives to the, the project budget overall. Um, and just for my own, I guess, a question, you know, when I look up at the Granite Peaks one and I look at Williston Square, um, the idea that more houses can be built around the Williston Square, and it's not that their ha houses can't be built around Granite Peak, they're just, they're kind of limited on how that area is built around, you know, because like you said, there's a lot of commercial properties. There is that one housing development kind of on the hill, yep. um, but I don't know how many houses can actually be up there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess that's one of my questions is, if houses do get started to be built um, around it, do you need as much, you know, I guess Missouri Ridge is a good indicator. They didn't have two places to go in and out until this year, mm -hmm. right? So then they had to rebuild it a little bit to have that second sure. entrance mm -hmm. out. Um, would that be something that was kind of put into play on I, either side? I think either site would have um, separate bus traffic in and out, which is critical, especially in the district that's growing with their busing. Um, and then secondary to that is uh, the, the consistent traffic flow, right? And making sure that that happens and has a positive impact on the, the, the streets around it. Um, so either way, we're looking at separate entry, exit, looking at a separate bus pickup drop-off area as well. So that'd be apples to apples between the two. Good question. Board members, any other questions? Um, so with Site A, yep. Granite Peak, um, how much, if any, land modification would have to be down there? Because there is some sloping areas. Yep. There w on, on the site, the 14 acres that we're looking at specifically is actually on the extreme east edge of 
the location. So if you're familiar out there, there's a, mm-hmm. there's a fence line and directly east is private property yet. So that area, again, was selected in the sense that we are, are going to have less impact on that. When we initially were talking on that site, we were raising some eyebrows because it was up on the hill closer to the road, which has some significant impacts there. Now, that being said, there's, we still need to get access from, say, 32nd onto that site. There's going to be some modification needs to happen, but there will lo- roughly be, um, I don't know, uh, again, there's, there's going to be a good, a good buffer between 32nd and 11th mm-hmm. um, to be able to make that happen. On our site specific, will there be grading? Yes, um, but there will be grading on the other one as well. I mean, if you look at the other one, there's a... <laughs> There's an old drainage swale that was there as part of the airport. Um, there's also some some ponds that have been roughed in there that we need to we need to work around. So there's again, I think we're going to see a similar amount of every work that's there. Okay, okay, um, and then so trying to figure out how best to phrase this question. Mm-hmm. Site B being on Willison Square is the, the sewers are already there, so it would just be having to hook up to them. Is Bo- that actually both right? both sites do have access to sanitary right on the south edge of both sites? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then electrical, of course, is just going to be a point yeah, of running those MPU lines. We and gas. Both are there on either site. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Well, then that answers that question. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, we got good access there. Um. The the one thing that I've been hearing from the most people, I I know that you got information, you know, from RSP, but. What people have been telling me is that that west side mm-hmm. is the side that they want to see a school yep. because of the, uh, the the various apartment complexes over there that retreat and so on, mm-hmm. um, the new developments that are going in over that way, yep. uh, that that's the side of town, at least the people who are contacting me, yep. that want to see a school, the first school built. Sure. I. And again, I, I think both sites, if you were, you, you're not going to lose on either one of the sites if you were to choose tonight. Um, um, and I think when it coming back with, with Rob's conversation is really about step one versus step two, right? So step one, having a facility in the center of town provides the most flexibility with the district overall. That's an, that's an area that can grab from both the north, west. I mean, it's right there in the center that we can the again the um, site a the granite peak site that catchment area from the west i think is we're going to see some growth there um for sure i don't know personally what that number is of students of what that catchment area would be at this point um but again all i can report is rob was feeling that 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 one in the center of town would be right now step one would be the best fit okay and then the last question i had is so traffic is always Mm -hmm. difficult (laughs) um morning drop-offs, yep. afternoon pickups. It doesn't matter where the school is, there's always going to be traffic congestion mm-hmm. for a period of time. Right. And when I think about both sites, I think that the Granite Peak site is potentially going to be safer traffic-wise mm-hmm. versus um, site B, the Williston Square because of US-2 being right there, and then also them planning on doing that giant roundabout Mm -hmm. and all of the other pieces, and then the large amount of construction that's going to be taking place in the Williston Square over the next few years. I go to Granite Peak being safer from a a surrounding construction and also traffic is... Is that a valid assumption? I think so. I unfortunately I don't have numbers to back any of the traffic up at this point. Yeah. Right? I think either site we'd it, it definitely warrant a traffic study to make sure if there's any need for any kind of um, controlled intersections. Um, don't want I don't want to have more roundabouts in the community, but I mean potentially you know just mm-hmm. some more um, study within that. Um, but yeah, I mean I think right now we can speculate that. I think either, either one of them will be good. The only reason I was talking with the Wilson Square site, again, it, you're entering and exiting off of a non-arterial road. Yes. Um, and I, I think that would have some positive impact on the site. Um, that being said, we do have right in, right out turn line already roughed out on the site, uh, site A, Granite Peak site, and 11th has an approach already planned on it that we would utilize as well. And that has a left-hand turn lane um, as well. So. Um, and then as far as construction um, conversation, 
I think either side, if the development starts happening, we're going to have dusty days. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's going to be, wind's going to pick up and blow some dust around. Um, both sites are planned to be um, fenced at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that just seems like a standard overall. So hopefully keeping the site safe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kasmer, Mr. Walstead, do you have any questions for Mr. Lippert? Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, just a question to the safety. Um, mm -hmm. I know we've got those apartments back there, and yep. then we've got the houses around down by um, Williston Square, but up by Granite Peaks. Obviously, we have the apartments behind Menards and all that. Um, but just from, I, I kind of wish we had a traffic study now. I know. Because yep. that's really hard to know. Yep. But for safety wise, for bikers, walkers, um, that's kind of my concern. Yep. I think either way, you're having to cross busy streets, you yep. know, no matter which school you choose. Um, but how do you? How do you vision somebody riding their bike across the street from Menards at that that right. roundabout as opposed to somebody riding their bike across the street over by the baseball fields? You know, right? I think I think you're right. You're still tra you're still crossing a large traffic street either way. Um, pedestrian protection is going to have to be a conversation with the city and what's appropriate to add into those. Um, but if we were looking at today, I think if you were to go walk around those sites and I think the connectivity that's of the sidewalks and the trails that are there today would, would lean us toward the Wilson Square site having the most connectivity today. Now that being said, it's just it's probably likely due to a function that the Granite Peak site just isn't completely developed or that area isn't completely developed out to have the to have the sidewalks and trails that are in that space right now. I think it could be done um, again with pedestrian safety. Uh, you know, crossings and, and the whole works. But um, yeah, I think, I think again, as we're talking about today, if we're building one um, in near term, that the Wilson Square site is probably more connected. And I guess based off your experience, um, have you seen where a school has been built in like an area like Granite Peaks and the city or, you know, they just figure out they need to add, you know, yield signs, they need to add more you know, cohesive things to help those students be safer. I mean, can we see that down the line, even though, you know, I think that's a continued work? conversation. And, okay. and some of the initial ones that we've had with the with the engineer's office and planning and zoning have been leaning towards that. Okay, they're starting to think about if there's any pedestrian crossings, controlled intersections that might be potentially needed here um, uh, as as a result of the location. Because I don't want to pigeonhole myself just to Williston Square with sure. the idea of what's happening now right. um, when something can be adjusted up at Granite Peaks to make it just as accessible. I think you'd be putting a lot of sidewalk in day one to do that. But yes, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're completely right. I mean, the, the landscape of either one of those sites could change within two, three years, right, right. Of, of what's happening. Um, and I think we're roughly equal um, of what's going to happen. Okay. So, yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering those mm -hmm. questions. Yep. Thanks, Nick. Uh, any other questions? Okay, what I'd like to do is open it up amongst the board. If anybody has any additional comments they'd like to make, we could just go down the line here and then ask for a motion after that. Well, I think we have to deal with uh, what's going on now, not what's going on in the future or what could be. I also think we have to think about the city, how how it, how it affects everybody in the city, how it may bring us uh, more housing, how it, you know, helps the city out uh, by putting it in the square, how that might bring, uh, you know, a little quicker housing, which we need desperately. Um, I just think it's a probably the best place to put the uh this school at this time. I think it marked off all the, checked all the right boxes, according to Nick. I think, uh, I don't know, I would talk to Dr. Fadley. I, you know, we'll see what he thinks. But in uh, what I think is that the Wilson Square is the place to put the building today. So that's where I'd be leaning. Um, you know, it's not that I'm against the Williston Square. It just, when I look at it as a whole, we don't really have an elementary school that suits that side of town. So when we talk about neighborhood schools, by putting it in Williston Square, we're, we're putting it in between 
Hagen, we're putting it in between, you know, all these other elementary schools that already exist within town. Mm -hmm. And for me, I know when Round Prairie was closed um, or reutilized, however you want to look at it, you know, that, that side of town kind of felt like they're having to bring their students in further. Um, and so for me, you know, it's not that I'm against doing it at Williston Square, but it does make me feel like that side of town does get more of a neighborhood school. We've got housing developments going up outside of there, and I'm not saying we don't need more housing developments within Williston Square, but, you know, I, I just, I see both sides of this. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just want the students and you know the, the families to feel like they're, they have a school close to them. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I feel like when we do the Williston Square, we are kind of condensing our elementary schools within the city of Williston. Sure. It's not that Granite Peak isn't the city of Williston, but it is more of a, an outside type of school um, capability, I would say, kind of like McVeigh. McVeigh kind of hits where Kyle lives, you know, time towards that type of s side of town, whereas right now you would have to go, um, yeah, to Hagen, basically, um, which we've already had to move kids out of because so many kids were considered, you know, close to Hagen, whether it be the apartments, whether it be out by um, Trenton Turnoff, you know, all those types of places, those kids were all kind of condensed over to that area. So um, I'm on the fence on both of this, so I'm definitely interested to hear the other side of the board, but that is one thing that I've thought about with Granite Peaks is just giving that side of town its own elementary school um, neighborhood feel, so. Yeah, I think that's a valid point, uh, Ms. Williams. I, I appreciate that sentiment as well, and I, I think that in time there's gonna be a school at both locations. I don't think that's probably any question, or at least that's why I'd see things in the future, but from a pedestrian and I think a vehicular vehicular <laughs> access, I think Williston Square makes more sense. Um, there have been times when 32nd Avenue has been closed in the wintertime because that steep hill is iced over and you can't get traffic up and down there. I think moving into Williston Square really shows a great intent and cooperation with the city of Williston that the school district could be the catalyst for both business and uh, residential development in that area. I would really be in favor of moving in that direction. And as I recall the heat maps that showed our student population in the city of Williston, uh, there's a lot that are west up in, near the Hagen Elementary, but then we have all of the apartments and developments on 42nd Street West on the north side up there. I also believe if students have to come down to the school from the west, it's easier to access it on 26th Street coming down 26th and then turning onto 16th Avenue than it would be to go down that 32nd. Uh, which is such a steep hill, I, I guess just accessing from that point. It would be easier to access Granite Peak development, that, that area, obviously from the highway, but I think from other parts of town, uh, I, I think there's easier access, especially for pedestrians and vehicles. And as Mr. Lippert has said, when you access the school in uh, the Williston Square, you're not accessing it directly from an arterial road. You have access from other directions, and I just think it sends a good message to the city of Williston that we believe in the vision and the direction of this development, and we could be the catalyst that really starts ramping in both commercial and residential development in that area. Mrs. Wheeler? Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything everyone has said so far. Um, th there's been a lot of comments over the last few years when the Williston Square was created that having a school there would become almost a glue for infrastructure that is planning to go in there. Um, and, and I agree with that. But at the same token, um, the people out west mm -hmm. have been asking for a school. Yep. And they've been asking for one for many, many, many years. Um, uh, so... And again, I go off of what I hear from the public and the overwhelming voice that I've been hearing from people who've contacted me is they want a school out on the west side first and then Williston Square second. Um, I live out on the west side of town and I know that that is a tremendous hot spot for families. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of families that live out there and those families are having to take their children to some of them are going to Hagen, some of them are going to McVeigh, some of them are going uh, to Lewis and Clark, some of them Wilkinson, they're going all over the place. Where if all those kids on the west side could be centralized to their own elementary school, that makes a heck of a lot more sense than having to drive a child from one side of town all the way over to the other side of town. Um, I was one of those parents. My, I live over by Hagen, but yet my children had to go to McVeigh. Mm -hmm. 
And I didn't like that for four years, having to drive my children clear across town when I had an elementary school a block and a half away. Mm-hmm. So I want to try to listen to the the citizens who've been asking for that school on the west side. Um, yeah. If just one point, if I may. <coughs> please, um, please. So I, I think to that point specifically is really the importance of the the, the boundary setting within the mm-hmm. within the district, right? Of of you know. To get to a neighborhood school, you should live in the neighborhood of the school, right? So, and and I, I know some are going to just innately have to travel, you know, and and hopefully there's additional busing things like that that can help assist with that. But um, hopefully, again, as these as these conversations are going and the boundaries can be you can be set and accommodate that, and hopefully alleviate having to drive all the way across town to McVeigh. So, oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Right. And you know, we we have secured that site at Williston Square, so if the way I'm looking at it is if the first school were to go at Granite Peak and then later on down the road when the school district and the population as a whole is ready to build another school, we have a secure location to be mm-hmm. able to do that. Yep. That's great. Well, I think both sites are great sites. I think I hope to see a school at each site someday. Uh, the reason why I would lean toward Williston Square is because I feel that falls in line better at this point in time with our strategic plan, um, neighborhood schools, and that was based on what Mr. Lippert said about what RSP had mentioned. So I think <clears throat> that would be the the logical way to get us to that next step by building at the Williston Square. But I also think that a school at, at Williston Square would possibly drive more growth in that area and ultimately um, increase our taxable valuation of the district, which would decreased amount that people would be paying for the school over time. So I, I would lean towards Williston Square myself. So, and uh, Dr. Paley, did uh, the did administ- do you guys have a recommendation, administration? On what well, certainly, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great problem to have. We have two sites that um, have a lot of uh, positives. Um, but in, in looking at and in, in having a conversation with the executive cabinet um, and uh, looking at the now, I would agree with Mr. Lippert uh, and some of the other comments that have been made that um, I, I just think the infrastructure is ready, um, more ready at the uh, Williston Square property. I think the walking paths are already in place, um, sidewalks, we would have a school where students could walk um, right as we open it up and as properties are built off an arterial um, so we don't have to come off of a main um, road to to uh, to get into our school site I think that has a lot of benefits for school number one uh, initially Um, there is no doubt that we're going to need both sites um, in the future if our Enrollment trends continue the way RSP has forecast them. Um, but um, I think the team uh, leans towards um, the square property uh, for the reasons I've shared. Thank you, Dr. Faley. Okay, board members, I'll open it up for a motion, and I would just ask that you don't refer to the site as A or B. I think that's going to be confuse- confusing. If if you want uh, the motion to be for Granic Pete, I'd Peak, I just would recommend you say Granite Peak or Williston Square, whichever the choice is going to be. I'll make a motion that we pick uh, um, the square. Mr. Casbert, was your intent to say the, the Williston Will- Square? Yeah, yeah, Williston Square, yes. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Casbert to approve the Williston Square. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Mr. Wallstead. Any discussion? I think this just goes back to what you had talked about earlier, Mr. Renner, about the strategic plan. That strategic plan also talks about neighborhood schools, and, and I know we're talking about doing that, um, and that just puts that so much higher on our list as, as it already is um, to show you know that, that west side of town. 
um, especially when we do start doing those boundary lines. Um, you know, a lot of times people, you know, we need to just take into account distance, all that kind of stuff that we've already talked about. And I think as long as we continue to make that a priority in once we, you know, if we can pass this bond, that they know that that's still a high priority is where their location is to the new, any school, Hagen, Wilkinson, Lewis and Clark, um, Williston Square, that that just needs to be communicated over and over and over, that we're fully aware that there's gonna be changes. Um, because people that are close to Hagen now could be going to the new school. People that are close to Lewis and Clark could be going to the new school. They could be going to Hagen, right? Depending on how those boundary lines are drawn, there's a shift in all ways um, because they are so close in proximity compared to that West Side school would have been. So, um, you know, just to the public, you know, like that's the main thing is just knowing any choice that we make is going to have a ripple effect of something. Um, but yes, I, I'm, I'm still very aware of how much neighborhood schools are important, even if we cannot put it in that west side right now, um, that we're, we make it a priority to make them feel seen, heard, and you know, like Mrs. Wheeler said, not feeling like they're driving in an extra eight miles when we can just put them at Hagen or we can put them at Lewis and Clark or something like that. And that will be on Dr. Fadley and your team to make that you know, happen with RSP and type of stuff. So, but I, I take all your guys' recommendations seriously. Mr. Lippert, thank you so much for being honest and giving us your, your expertise because it's not an easy decision. Um, it affects so many families no matter what we do. Um, but our strategic plan is where I always try to follow my guidance. And at the end of the day, that's what I'm gonna do tonight, so. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Any other discussion from board members? Um, our strategic plan is incredibly important and I follow it also. I feel that it's incredibly, incredibly important and the neighborhood schools are really important, which is why I really still think that Grant Peak site makes a lot more sense. That creates that neighborhood school. We've got so many kids up on the west side of town. Having a school on the west side of town will follow that strategic plan of having neighborhood schools because that would truly be within the neighborhood versus trucking them across. But yet, um, you know, Mr. Stramick said, you know, that in, he did the strategic plan that the Wilson Square would be the place he would put it to go with our neighborhood schools. So that, you know, that helps me decide that the Wilson Square would be the, uh, you know, the best spot. One of the reasons that I believe it should be the best spot. I mean, that's he thought that that would be the first school that should be built, and I think I, I go along with him. Yeah, I go back to the student population currently at Hagen Elementary School, which is bursting at the seams in the heat map. Uh, there are so many students in that part of town that I, I, I that's why I go back to the Williston Square location for this. I just think it's the wise thing to do. I think it's prudent for us to access that that area with our education. Very true. But when you look at the heat map, what what corner of town has the most red? North, south, east, or west? The west side. The west side has the highest red concentration. So if we really think about it, just looking at only the heat map and only looking at that and not taking any other parameter into account and thinking about our strategic plan of neighborhood schools and where's the heat of the most students, it's on the west side. So if you don't take anything else into account, if you only look at that data, it makes the most sense to have a school on the west side to capture that heat signatures of students. Again, taking out all the other pieces of data, only looking at the heat signature and our strategic plan, which says neighborhood schools, and that's the area that we have the most heat. That's what I'm thinking about, and that's what a lot of citizens are thinking about as well. One of the other things, Mrs. Wheeler, that kind of, I came in here really thinking I was gonna um, sway towards Granite Peak. Um, 
and looking at the cost analysis that that was one thing that was different to me you know i thought you know one place is donated one wasn't you know but it all evened out in a way in the end but also the safety part of it and again like i said to mr lipper i kind of wish we would have had that traffic study of what could have been done all that kind of stuff because it is very important to me as people that work in this community most people are too working households both both people work and you hear all the time where people can't go to work until 8 15 8 30 9 o'clock because they're having to drop their kids off um, and so kind of listening to everybody talk about sidewalk safety that type of stuff you know i want to give parents the capability of allowing and trusting that their students can get to school safely and i do feel like williston square does give that capability a little bit sooner if not better um, and it has a higher i would say presence of other parents on those roads um, police officers on those roads right whereas up on the west side right now as of right now until more is developed there's not going to be as much as that um, and and so that's kind of what swayed me because like I said I, I, I thought I was very heavy on the granite peak um, and so all of the above is really swayed me but the safety is one of the biggest things because I do want students to be able to make that choice to walk to school um, obviously you may not have kindergartners walking but you know fourth graders that type of stuff Parents should be able to trust within a half a mile, you would hope, that they can ride their bikes. And, you know, that, that's what I want to see around here is when I think of neighborhood schools, I think of students being able to get themselves there as well. And I do feel like Williston Square gives that capability a little bit more right now. Um, but my hope is always that there'll be two places that help everybody, you know, that for the future. So, um, but I, I appreciate all your sentiment too because I, I was on... I was definitely for Granite Peak walking in here. And, you know, unfortunately for me, I just have listened to too much at this point to, yeah. you know, it makes sense to me for Williston Square at this point. But again, I appreciate everything you're saying. And I haven't heard from anyone specifically asking me. So, you know, I understand that that weighs heavy as well. Yeah, I don't disagree that Granite Peak would be a great location. And I, I, again, I think I go back to pedestrian traffic. I'm probably more sensitive to pedestrian traffic because that's how I get around all the time. And then I think um, that already on 11th and 32nd, there's already a tremendous amount of traffic flow just with our high school traffic going through that area. And the city might have to address that a little if we, if and when we put another grade school in there. I think that's going to have to be addressed there as well. But right now, I, I believe, too, for foot traffic and vehicles, that the easiest access is going to be in the Williston Square area. I was just going to comment on uh, the heat map. You know, Ms. Wheeler, you mentioned west, but I, I think it really depends on which, where, is your, where you put a pinpoint on the map and say west, because <clears throat> if you're talking about Granite Peak and say west on the heat map, I would disagree. I would say that you got to go north from, from Granite Peak to get to, to that heat map to where the, the, the students are. If you're talking about the, the Williston Square, then I would agree, yeah, west, west would take you to where a majority of that heat map shows. So I think this is a good problem we have. We got two great locations. I'm, I'm just leaning myself towards the Williston Square. Board members, do you have any other comments before we call the roll? Okay, hearing nothing, Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll. Wheeler? No. Kasmer? Aye. Walstead? Yes. Williams? Aye. Renner? Aye, motion passes for the one. Next agenda item <clears throat> is 5D, board self-assessment discussion and potential action with Aspen Group International. So John Steech with uh, Aspen Group International reached out to me. As you know, we have a contract with Aspen Group, and we have two more remaining visits on our contract with them. And he was wanting to know if if we would, the board would want him to come out to Williston and uh, to do a board self-assessment. Uh, he would lead us through that <clears throat> process. Um, it'd be about a four-hour process. We'd go through our policies. But there's also another option where we go through the governance culture policies and the board superintendent relations policies. But then there's also another option where they serve, survey senior administration in the district and ask them questions about how, 
how they feel the board is doing and they'd go over those results too um, i sent that sent an email to board the board last week thursday and in that email it it showed some of the questions that that would be asked of senior administrators so i guess i want to know if the board is interested in having mr steech come out and do the self-assessment with us and if so are we interested in that survey as well I would like to see the survey um, and then it's part of our contract so I think that we should have them come out otherwise we're paying for something that we're not going to use so yeah I would also like to see them come out and give us those last two visits um, you know I always say the most uncomfortable conversations tend to get the best results and board assessments are not made to be comfortable they're made to be informative and in what we can improve on from not only our employees but from the district that we serve um, and so for me I, I'm interested in seeing that um, you know and I want to have that and I want to build off of that because anytime you hear something about yourself all you can do is improve or create more challenges for yourself and you know as leaders we are here to be challenged so I, I look forward to that conversation and I would like the survey done yes I agree with Miss Williams I think it's uh, very important that we listen to our our peers and our, our teachers and uh, staff and I think it, um, you know, we should go through a, a self-assessment. Um, this is something new. Um, we should figure out how we're doing. Yeah. I agree, Mr. Kasmer. Since we're in our infancy with this governance model, I believe it would be wise to have representation from Aspen Group come and meet with us. And I don't mind the survey either. I think it's good for all of us to look in the mirror that way. So thank you. Okay, so I'd have a motion on what the board's wishes are. A uh, motion to have Aspen Group come out for their final two visits for a board self-assessment discussion and potential uh, survey. A second. So um, one point of clarification, this would just be for the one visit. Um, okay. It, this would re only require one visit, I should say. Um, there, there still would be that remaining visit and we're or been discussing different things to do with that as well but this this self-assessment would just require one visit do you want me to adjust my motion I would I think okay. it needs to be amended okay <coughs> if that's your yeah my intent for was for the self-assessment so if that was one visit only then that's my clarification to that yeah motion to um, Motion to bring Aspen Group back for a board self-assessment discussion and potential survey. Okay, so we have an amendment. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. Okay, any discussion? Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll on the amendment. Kasmer? Aye. Walstead? Yes. Williams? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Renner? Aye. Motion passes now. Now we will call the roll on the full, full motion. Walstead? Yes. Williams? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Kasmer? Aye. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. Next we move on to informational report to the board. We have a Retention presentation by the Human Resources Department. Okay, hi guys. Board, it's nice to see you. It's been a while since I've been up here to see all of you. Um, for anybody who does not know, I'm Amanda Denovan. I'm the Assistant HR Director of the District. Mrs. Billy Hughes unfortunately cannot be with us tonight. She is not feeling well, so she does send her apologies. So there's been a lot of questions about resignations. It's that time of year. We start to see a lot of that movement. People are coming, people are going. So um, we were asked to present a little bit of information to you and hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have. So if you'll go to the next slide there. Um, we pulled the resignation data for our certified staff for 2023 
compared to 2024. So if you look at this slide here, you can see that 2024 is in the orange compared to the gray, which was 2023. Numbers are looking good. So I'd like to move to the next slide so we can actually see a little bit of that breakdown. Um, so when you look by the numbers here, um, in 2023, the numbers were obviously higher in April and May. Um, we haven't hit May yet. Our numbers were a little bit higher in February and March, and I don't want to call them high in April, and even February honestly wasn't that high. But I just want to point out that um, this time last year was a very different time in our district. So what I want to point out is that last year we were going through negotiations, correct? So can't issue contracts to any staff until those negotiations are done. Um, the negotiations were finished on May 3rd last year in 2023. Contracts could not be issued until after that point, which is why you see so many of the resignations happening in April and May last year. People were waiting on the negotiations to be completed to decide if they were going to stay or not. Um, the other thing last year, we had a lot of transition last year. Every year has been kind of a transition year for us since the merger. This is the third year now. Um, we're coming on to the end of the third year. And from our perspective in the HR department, we feel that we're getting a little more solid, a little more steady, a little less movement, even though it might not appear that way sometimes. It doesn't feel that way. The reality is there is less movement out of the district. So this year, since the negotiation process was already done, we didn't have to do that. Um, we jumped on the ball and we got our contracts out early. Um, March 1st is the soonest that you can get contracts out to your staff. We had contracts um, available starting March 8th this year. Once those certified employees receive those contracts in their hands, they have 14 calendar days to return them. We are past that deadline now. So those numbers that you see, really that should be basically it for resignations for this year. Um, at this point, if we see any more certified resignations, um, it's because they're going to breach their contract now that they've already signed with us for the next school year. So, you know, again, for us, we see this as a good thing. That's low numbers compared to last year. So that's, that's good for us. Um, the other thing that we wanted to point out was that this year we had several of our J1 exchange teachers that are leaving solely because they have to, not because they want to. Um, typically they are allowed to be here for three to five years depending on if they can get an extension or not on their J1 visa. And many of them were hired you know, five years ago and it's time for them to leave unfortunately. Um, so the last slide, we, we just kind of did a really short and sweet presentation today. Um, but some good news, um, as of Friday, we had 13 new certified staff in the pipeline somewhere of being hired. So um, that's also really good. It's early in the year. It's early in the hiring season. Um, teachers right now, this is their time of year to make those choices on if they're staying or going. So we're, we're positive that we're going to get a lot more new staff um, and earlier than we have in past years. Um, we also have a lot of former employees that are showing interest in returning to the district, which again to us in our department signifies that we're stabilizing somewhere. People are wanting to come back and, and be a part of our district again, which is a good thing because we're a great district to be at. Um, we do remain committed to finding new ways to attract and retain the qualified educators that we need in our district. Um, we have a lot of a lot of ideas that, you know, hopefully we can start to incorporate some of those in our next year. We are talking about doing some more aggressive hiring campaigns with some, you know, commercials. I don't know if you've ever checked out Bismarck Public Schools. They've got some great um, commercial kind of feel to their hiring campaign. Um, Mr. Glenn and Mr. Hazer really kind of set me up earlier with some of the things that they talked about. Vital Network is a big thing that we will be looking at at a district level, um, especially for the retention side of things. We're gonna be putting together a district group that is going to look at all of the information as a whole. Not only is what's happening at Lewis and Clark, what's happening at Central Campus, et cetera, but from our side of things, how can we you know, approach some of those bigger overarching topics and, and do what we can to bring some of that 
you know, to help our staff out. Um, they also brought up some good points about not enough subs. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, there's never enough subs. We're always looking for subs and we're, we're continuing to look at ways to make that a more appealing, um, appealing option for people in town um, to do. Vacancies, um, I, I don't want to give a number on how many vacancies we have currently tonight. I'm not prepared to do that, but I can certainly update you guys on that at a later time if you're interested in knowing what our vacancy situation is. We have a lot of movement right now just because we're doing a lot of internal transfers and talking about you know what the school district is gonna look like next year as far as opening new sections and that type of stuff. So there's still some movement right now, um, so I don't have those numbers tonight. Um, but that's that's kind of what I have tonight for you guys. So I don't know if you have any questions. Board members, do you have any questions for Mrs. Denovan? Ms. Denovan, how many um, how many employees are on the the payroll for District Seven? Well, I believe if you're talking about our full time regular staff, I think we're around eight hundred something. And if I understand you right, we had approximately thirty resignations. Is that what you're saying? If I understand right? Correct, yeah. of our certified staff, yes. So this so is certified only. So right. teachers, administrators, right. this isn't any of our classes. So that's about 3%. Yes. That's amazing. We're, okay. we're pretty happy with the numbers this it's year. amazing. I came from an organization that had a turnover of 105%, so. <laughs> Board members, any questions or comments? Um, thank you, Mrs. Denovan, for the presentation. I would like a, an update on vacancies. Maybe Ms. Dr. Fadley could put that in a Friday yep, update sure. or something like that. Um, and the other thing is we talked about this with Aspen. I'm not sure where we ended with, with but the exit interviews that come through through HR, mm -hmm. the board is not privy to those. Um, and I don't expect to see all exit interviews with names, you know, all that type of stuff. But we did talk about maybe getting a summary of some of the challenges that are within those exit interviews and, and also the positives, we'd, we'd love to know. Um, but it gives us an idea of the culture that's been created here. We, we always talk about surveys and all that type of stuff and sometimes people don't wanna do surveys. But when they're exiting the district for positive or negative reasons, they typically will put the, their honest answer um, because they want to leave that, that position with their truth, you know, their experience and to help the next person or to help their friend that's still in that position. Um, so that's something I, I don't know, um, Chairman Renner, where we kind of left that out with Aspen, but that's something I would just wanted to tell you guys that that was something that we had looked at as a, as a board um, during our um, last meeting was just kind of getting a better understanding of why people are leaving. Um, resignations are one thing, but exit interviews are another. So um, that's one thing I just wanted to tell you. But thank you guys for all you're doing. I know it hasn't been a, an easy three years with some of the changes that had made, been, been made within this organization. And so seeing the numbers as they are, um, you know, they'll never flatline completely. But, you know, like you said, we can get more consistent and get a better understanding instead of having these peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, because of changes we're making, it's more of changes in their lives that are being made. So, right. but thank you guys for all you do and very noticeable. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing the new ways of recruitment because yes. the whole the whole United States is dealing with recruitment issues. So it is going to take um, standing out um, in some ways. And I look forward to seeing how we do that. So thank Absolutely. you. Mm -hmm. Any other board members' questions or comments? She already said what I was gonna say. <laughs> Mr. Renner, may I make one comment? Uh, yeah, just Mr. Gasser, do you have anything to? No. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Fadley. I just wanted to publicly thank the HR department. Um, I place high expectations on getting contracts out uh, as quickly as possible this year, because I know that uh, when you do that, um, you get the, um, the tier one applicants, uh, when you get con the, uh, when you have those positions available, and I, I can tell you that our HR department worked tirelessly to make that a reality, and I just want to say thank you publicly. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Donovan. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, the next agenda item is uh, board assessment. Oh, sorry, no. I'm, uh, 
owners representative discussion okay so at our last board meeting uh, the board had asked dr paisley and i to look into uh, find out information about owners representation so this would be in regards to this bu uh, bu building of a potential school so i'll go first and then mention what i found out and then dr paisley can jump in if he has anything he'd like to add um <clears throat> so mr junt had had recommended i call um Kristen Smith, she's a school board president in, in a school district in Durango, Col Colorado. And when, when this was initially brought to us, the, the individual said that this is something they do do in Colorado is have an owner's representative when they're, when they're building a school. And so I, I reached out to her and asked her what that process looked like. <clears throat> and she said it's true, they, they do use an owner's representative when, they, when they're building a school. Um, it's very similar to a construction manager at risk, the job they do. They, they oversee the, the job. They, they put it out for bids. They make recommendations to the board on which bid they would pick. Um, so that, that's the process they're using in Colorado. It's very similar to the construction manager at risk, risk process. I talked to uh, a construction manager at risk here in Williston that I know and asked him about um, owner's representatives and if he knew of any companies in the area or the state that did it, he was not aware of any companies that did it. Um, he, he did know that the fees typically are one to one and a half percent of the project total. So like on a project like ours, we'd be looking at spending half a million to a million and a half uh, dollars. Um, and typically what they do is they, <clears throat> like if you're pouring concrete that day, they're gonna be out there making sure that's actually being poured and done correctly. When, when the architect is designing the building, they're going to be there oversee. They would be basically a third set of eyes there, besides the construction manager at risk, watching that design being built and maybe questioning things and, you know, say, oh, you guys don't actually need that. So they, they're looking for efficiencies. Um, so those are those are the type of services a uh, owner's rep could provide. I I don't know of any company in the state that that does it. Um, from my understanding, uh, obviously Colorado has them. Um, I've heard Minneapolis. You can find them out there. But uh, so, Dr. Faley, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I think you did an excellent job, Mr. Renner. The, the only thing that I would add is um, utilization of the CMAR process. That's basically um, the way that it is designed is to put the risk back on the contractor. Um, and to um, to get the contract or the the uh, construction manager on board as quickly as possible once um, you begin the process, so that the architect and the uh, construction manager can work together um, to do the what's uh, referred to as value engineering of the project. Um, I did reach out to a retired superintendent. Um, and talked with them about the owner representative um, um, process and uh, this particular individual, um, their, their district utilized a, a process where they used, uh, uh, once they identified that they were going to open a new school, they would hire the principal um, to assist with the planning, um, to sit in on all the construction meetings with the uh, construction manager and the architect um, to report on a regular basis monthly to the board in the uh, public board meeting in the informational section um, but that allowed for a couple of things to happen that allowed for an extra set of eyes um, it also allowed for the planning that uh, is necessary to open a new school to be um, done in conjunction with uh, the timeline as it's being built so that's just another way um, to get an owner's representative at the table. Um, by all means, it's not, um, I'm not saying that we should do that, but um, I, do, I do think that uh, a half a million dollar expenditure is, is, is not warranted um, because in my opinion, when you take a half a million dollars out of the project, that means you have to cut something that is uh, in the project and I don't want to do that. Board members, any questions or comments? Um, just, you know, I was 
one that kind of brought this up after hearing it through community members. Um, and, and I'm with you guys. I, I'm, I'm not interested in spending 500 thousand to a million dollars on something that kind of is already in place for us or is in place um, and I mean this with no disrespect to Mr. Lippert or any building person but I do think there is a need or a want for a different level or different set of eyes to be within this project build and whether that be an, a principal that is going to be hired to run that school I think it just bodes well within the community who does have some distrust to the processes within the building process process and I'm okay with people being distrustful of certain things when we can find ways to help alleviate that fear and if a principal who we all know principals teachers they're very trusted people see them with their children they you know they, they truly trust them so that would be my recommendation is to really look into that um, obviously I don't know how that process is of figuring out which principal if the bond did pass how, who would take over that new school or whatever but that would be definitely a recommendation I would have and see how that process works because the principal has ownership of that school from the beginning to end and knows exactly what they go through from drop off to pick up um, so if they see something that's not aligning with something they're the first that could say oh by the way this is why um, and then also having a monthly update to the board allows the public to not only see the builders talking to us but also a staff member that's also bought into wh how far the, how the project is going um, and all that kind of stuff so um, I'm not again interested in spending that type of money but I am interested in finding another set of eyes to maybe help with that um, so I agree. I don't want to spend that kind of money either. And I do know that the public wants to be either more involved or have more oversight. Um, it's disappointing that they don't, we don't have anything like that here in North Dakota. So um, out here in the West, we're used to making things our own and creating things our own. So I think we, maybe we should consider creating our own. Um, maybe a voluntary type of a thing, a, um, a committee almost, um, that could be comprised of maybe a, a few... Uh, Williston staff and admin or two and maybe some community members to be that owner's voice because they're the owners um, we don't know who the principal is going to be of the new school yet we haven't hired a principal or assigned anyone to a new building yet so it would be difficult to assign a, a principal to a building that doesn't even exist so maybe creating a small committee at least at the beginning stages would be a way to do this. So one thing uh, Mrs. Smith mentioned is is called that particular school, Durango School District. They have a what's called a citizens bond oversight committee, and so they they sit in on a lot of the construction meetings um, and, and just are more part of that process. And they uh, they, they they're just, they're just kind of strict. Um, They've, they set some guidelines to get on that committee. A, a lot of the community members have to have some type of background in construction so that you're not bringing someone on that has no idea about construction is kind of holding up the committee. Mm -hmm. And they, they do leave one or two spots on there for um, just parents that maybe don't have any construction experience. I, I, I didn't bring that up tonight because I'm not sure if that would be a board decision to do that or if that's a superintendent decision. I've been trying to review the governance policies and... and think about that I was gonna tell Dr. Faley at our next meeting about this committee that I found out but since it, you brought it up I just wanted to mention it there there is such a thing out there that some school districts have utilized I know in the past and I'm talking the more not not terribly distant past but probably seven or eight years um, the PAC committee was the one that worked with the district when it came to these types of projects that might be something to look at and then adding on to that some an admin or two and some staff uh, but I agree there has to be um, there has to be rules and boundaries and um, but the public is not very trusting right now and there's a lot of information going around and this might be a way to help with that getting the information out and allowing comment 
about the project. Not necessarily steering the ship, but offering comment. Board members, any other questions you have or comments? I think what what I've heard is that the for sure the board is not interested in me and Dr. Fadley finding out any more information on an owner's representative. Would that be an accurate statement? Okay. Um, so we are at 7.30. We're just right before public, communicating with the public. I'd like to take a five minute recess and then we'll reconvene here at 7.33.
section of our meeting. Public participation at public at board meetings is governed by district policy BCBA. Meetings of the board are conducted for the purpose of carrying on the business of the schools and therefore are not public meetings, but meetings held in public. Although there is no legal requirement that the public be given an opportunity to speak at board meetings, it is the policy of this board to afford that opportunity in accordance with the following procedures. One, only items on the published board agenda will be discussed at any meeting of the board unless the superintendent or a board member requests an addition to the agenda of a regular meeting and the board members present approve in accordance with board policy. Two, no individual may speak more than once. Three, please state your name for the record. State the agenda item you're speaking to. Comments will be limited to no more than three minutes. Um, it, public comment will be limited to no more than 30 minutes in total. The board has adopted policies governing patron complaints. The public is required to seek redress through these policies. The public will be prevented from commenting on a topic if it is one governed, governed by district complaint policy and the complainant has not followed the procedure contained in the policy and or the policy prohibits the public from bringing the complaint before the board or two concerns a topic that is prohibited from prohibited by law from disclosure to the public such as a student's educational record. Undue interruption or other interference with the orderly conduct of board business cannot be allowed. Defamatory or abusive remarks are always out of order. The presiding officer may terminate the speaker's privilege of address if after being called to order, she, he persists in improper conduct or remarks. Furthermore, an individual who is persistently disruptive of a school board meeting may be removed from that meeting by order of the presiding officer. If you wish to provide any public comment this evening, please step forward to the podium, announce your name for the record, as well as the agenda item you are speaking to on this evening. Hello, my name is Deb Kemp and I am talking on 3A. I really do want to give a shout out to Mr. Glenn and Mr. Hazer. Um, I'm really lucky to be there every Thursday over lunch hour. I have seen firsthand the staff working very hard with the students and the, the relationships they have with students. But let me tell you, if people think that there's not overcrowding there, they really need to step in that building and spend some time there. We really do need to get fifth grade out of there. Um, that would alleviate some issues that we're dealing with. Um, when you have too many students in the lunchroom, what happens at that age? Well, they all want to be social at that age. There's a lot of hormones going, and one boy might be this size, the other one's six foot. I mean, when I walked down the hallway, I felt part of the kids. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on. So there is overcrowding in that building, and that is one of the issues. Another thing I wanted to bring up is I was part of the middle school being attached to the, at that time, high school. That building was built for 185 kids per grade. So 185 for seventh, 185 for eighth grade. That's what it was built for because our enrollment at that time was declining. And we now have way over that. And if we didn't have the ASB, which is probably about 100 students over there per grade, about um, not even, maybe 90, I don't know, but it's close to that. So we really, truly, truly have an overcrowding issue. That also doesn't help with behaviors. They bounce off each other. So I just wanted to say kudos to the staff there. They are working very, very, very hard um, to work with kids that do have behaviors, but also to reach the kids that you can see that are quiet or that are struggling to fit in or whatever. So I see that all the time. So I do encourage people to sign up for subbing or volunteering and get involved and let's, let's help these teachers and staff. That's what they need is our support. Thank you. Any other public comment to be offered this evening? My name is Susan Draper, and I will speak on the, I guess, five. So uh, thank you um, for having your open forums on Saturday and uh, the other times. I went to two of them. Um, there were a couple things that I asked to be changed. They were changed, and so I appreciate that. Um, I asked for Round Prairie to be added to the schools because it wasn't. 
Um, so those changes were made. I just want to, I, I, I mean, Miss Deb Kemp, she went, went down this road, so I'll go down it a little bit. Um, so on the, in that meeting on Saturday, I sat a lot with the JHL, whatever that guy is back there. He, and he, we talked a lot. So Tioga this year, they built a school here in 2024. Their square footage is $480 per square foot. That's $200 less per square foot than what we're hearing from what you guys are proposing. If I were to times that, I'm maybe be a number girl. 200 times the square foot that you guys are proposing is $16 million. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the community about the yes and the people who want no. I've never heard somebody who want, was gonna vote no say that they don't care about the kids and that they don't care about this community. They've never once said that. Matter of fact, if people are vo voicing their concern, I think they are concerned about the community. I think they are concerned about the kids. I think they are concerned about the teachers. I don't think, I don't think anybody in here doesn't think we need a new elementary school. I think it's the price of the elementary school. I think it's being fiscally responsible. Hawaii built a school, an elementary school, for $610 per square foot. That's $70 less than what we're proposing. $70 less, and it's in Hawaii. So I guess my point is, is that the community is at odds. We haven't heard one word from the board, not one about what we could do to bring the community together because both have logical reasoning. They both, both sides understand it's the cost. It's the cost of it. So I'd encourage you all to think about that and bring the community together and go back and find out why Tioga is $200 per square foot less. And I did ask the JLG guy this weekend. We had the conversation. And he said it was a different builder, and he also told me that it was closer to Minot. I, I think all of you know I'm pretty blunt. See it, I'm going to call it. I don't care. We're not that much different than Minot, let's be honest. We're 45 minutes away. Tioga's 45 minutes away. Yes, Mrs. Draper. That's all I have. Any other public comment this evening? And I would just ask that we we stick to the agenda. I think we've gotten a little off of that. Um, so please stick to the agenda. Thanks for the reminder. Charlotte Moore, 3A, congrats on your new leadership role. Um, so I just wanted to be clear on the 5A because the staff that was presenting it said it earlier that the teachers were leaving because he opened the store, not me. That teachers were leaving because of behavioral issues but for the last 14 meetings, it was people in the community. So I just want to be clear on which one that was. And he opened the door, not me. Um, location of the new school. You want the kids to be near their home, yet you uprooted Missouri Ridge. That wasn't a thing then. You wanted them to be able to bike and walk to location. So I was just wondering which one it was. Location, location, location. Um, I'm wondering where the enthusiasm is. Now we need to get rid of the fifth graders, but they were just put there. I don't know if I understood that incorrectly. We do need to support our staff and teachers. I 100% agree, and I agree with Susan. We need to bring our community together. I'd like each of you to use your discernment, but I just don't understand that whole thought process. And I guess I'm gonna use Sarah's words that the most challenging conversation are the most productive but I'd like some consistency in the things that you guys say. But thank you for everything that you guys do. But the behavior might start with somebody that throws papers on the floor when it's handed to them, just saying. Any other public comment to be offered this evening? 
Hello there, I'm Karen Krenz. I just want to start out by thanking you for considering the owner's representative. I really appreciate that. Just makes everybody accountable. And I think right now we want to make sure everybody's being held accountable. I am going to speak on 8D, um, the BAR program. Um, I, I was at the meeting at Wilkinson when this was approved the first time and I felt like I just needed to reiterate and say something that kind of came to concern to me and I just wanted to share it with you just to, you know, consider it. So if you read your contract with the bar program on number nine, it seems to be that a third party is going to have access to the records of the clients for up to three years. Even if you discontinue the client or the program, they can hold on to those records for three years. Now, um, I'm concerned about that, being a parent, that a third party has access to things on my child. And I just wanted to make sure it is called Hazelden Betty Ford, which is, if you do your due diligence, and I really ask you to, it is funded by Bill Gates. It is a program that he has implemented, him and his wife, and it's backed by them. So I just would love for you to do your due diligence, but I just wanted to let you know if you didn't notice that on number nine on that contract, that it is a third party that will have the client's information for up to three years. So thank you. Any other community members that would like to offer public comment this evening? Okay, seeing nothing, we will move on to next item, which will be 7B, Wilson Basin School Board, response to previous board meeting public comment. Um, uh, there, there really wasn't, I don't think, anything to respond to. Last week, Mr. Kemp gave up and gave some comments, but it, um, I don't think there's probably anything to respond to. So we will move on there to, uh, well, and thank you for, to him for commenting, but we'll move on to Item eight, superintendent consent agenda. What's the board's wishes here? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the superintendent consent agenda as submitted tonight. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I just wanted to say, as usual, the just thank you to um, Mrs. Winner, Mr. Holman, and Ms. Land for their service to the district. Um, as a parent that had a student go through Mrs. Land, um, you know, she she was an amazing asset to this community and to this um, to the school. Uh, I I didn't have the option of or I didn't have the availability to have Mrs. Winner or Mr. Holman, but you know they're all a loss to us, and I appreciate Mr. Holman's. Um, all their letters, but just the honesty in each letter of resignation because it's no different to me than when we do the exit interviews. It's the best way for the board and the community to see why and how people are feeling within their, their position and why they may or may not be wanting to stay or leave. And it always makes me smile when I see like Mrs. Winter saying, you know, it didn't work out right now, but she would love to come back if it does. Um, Mrs. Land is looking at becoming a substitute teacher. Um, so it just shows that they're not leaving because they don't want to be here. There's different options that have came up that better suit them and we always support people that do that so thank you to all of them for their service to our district and our community thank you mrs. Williams any other comment from the board I'm just gonna echo the thank you as well for the teachers um, and then a personal message uh, my daughter one of my daughters had uh, Francesca mrs. land and uh, adored her especially her little library so um, thank you and uh, hopefully we'll still be able to see you around any other comments okay here nothing mrs. Langford you can call the roll Williams aye Wheeler aye Kazmer aye Walstead yes Renner aye motion passes Next agenda item would be number nine, board consent agenda. What's the board's wishes here? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the board consent agenda as presented this evening. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? 
just want to say thank you to all the election officials that have volunteered to work with us. Um, their job is so important in these types of situations and uh, just look so thankful that people are willing to step up to the plate because not all bon not all um, elections have gone what co people consider smoothly and they've been under the radar sometimes. So um, just appreciate anyone willing to put their neck out there to take on these roles. So thank you guys. Any other comments from the board? Mrs. Langford, you can call the roll. Wheeler? Aye. Kasmer? Aye. Walstead? Yes. Williams? Aye. Renner? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, number 10, board debrief of meeting. I believe this was uh, Mrs. Wheeler, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, no, I thought this was a good meeting. We had a lot of um, hearty conversation, but very respectful conversation of everyone's opinion, which is the way that it should be. Uh, and everyone had an opportunity to talk about their own individual opinions. We may not always agree, but at least we can listen um, to each other uh, with an open mind and uh, be respectful of one another. And that is uh, what should be done. So I thank everyone. Um, I have a couple other comments. Should I just keep going or let everybody else have a turn? Mm, you can finish. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, al along the lines of um, all of us having uh, different opinions and being respectful for one another, um, I hope that um, this is something that continues. Um, you know, it's not anything different than has been in the past, but um, we had so we have some more conversations that are going to be coming around. We have the vote coming up. We have other elections coming up. So things are going to get potentially dicey, and hopefully everyone can continue to be respectful of one another's opinions. Um, you know, people make comments about um, not having a uh, one solid voice. We do have one solid voice. However, within that voice are seven individual representations of that voice. Sometimes those seven do not correlate 100%, but they end up in the same spot, which is the one voice. Um, we may disagree on something, but at the end of the meeting, and the meeting has been adjourned, uh, it is our responsibility to be one voice and to honor each other. So um, that's all I have to say. Uh, but yeah, good meeting. Yeah, I thought it was a great meeting. I think we, you know, to hear about a school that's, you know, ready to turn things around and uh, to see that, you know, the resignations aren't as bad as everybody thought they were. You know, things aren't quite as bad as people think they are. I mean, if they just look at the information that's given out there uh, things are moving in the right direction we need a new school let's all vote yes uh, I, I guess I I'd like the board see back I felt like public comment kind of waded into a gray area and then it even went a little further than that I felt like it wasn't wasn't on the agenda at times and I didn't stop it I just wanted to know I so want feedback from the fellow board members if they felt they should have did a better job in the future at that. I think you run a slippery slope, Chairman Renner, um, because you public comment really is for people to express their challenges that they have with us, but it's also to be in a very um, strategic way that follows what we're able to talk about. And I think tonight it did definitely get into a gray area, but again, I would never want your job to have to figure out when that has to stop. Um, so I, I think just you acknowledging it is enough, and I think that next in the next meeting when we are able to answer some of those questions, that we can kind of get it back on track. Um, but I did just want to make a comment to some of the things that were maybe spoke about. The public forums is a way for the community to tell us their challenges that they have with our bond. Um, meeting with Dr. Fadley individually, writing the board individually. There's many ways that you can reach out to get your your concerns heard, and for people. For individuals to continually ask the board to do more, there's only so much the board can do 
um, at a time, and that's why we, we create these forums and why we have public comment and all those things. So, you know, I, I always walk away feeling like I should do more, but also knowing I'm doing the best we can, and we're doing more than I would say five years ago did, 10 years ago did, and we'll always adjust to more, I would say, but right now as it sits, the board has done their due diligence in trying to reach the public, and I'm fully aware that nine people showed up on Saturday, and I can't force people to show up. I can't force them to ask questions. I can't force them to like the answers. I can't, I can't do any of that, but I can create situations for them to be available, for our, our staff to be available, for board members to be available, and I feel like we've done that. Um, so I, I always just want to tell you guys, I'm proud to serve next to you. I know you all have the right hearts. I know you guys have the right values in place. And I know that kids, staff, and this community is at the heart of what we're all here for. Um, and so even on rough days, I still believe that. And I truly believe that you guys are the, the best of the best in this community. And I will always enjoy and always have your backs when talking about serving next to you, regardless of like Mrs. Willer said, I don't agree with all your guys' statements. You don't agree with mine, but at the end of the day, your intentions are pure, and that's what I believe in. So thank you guys. Mr. Renner, may I make a comment? Uh, no, I think Mr. Wallstead was just gonna go, and then, then, yeah. You know, we're in a position where we make decisions here that have an impact 100 years from now our brick and mortar buildings that are in our city right now, there were men and women sitting at a board table generations ago making the decisions just like we're making tonight. And I'm glad they made those decisions. And I'm sure they were difficult for them and a challenge at the same time for the community. You know, we're here wrestling over building one school and yet in the span of 13, 14 years, our community built five schools. And I would dare say that when you figure out proportionately earned income then and the cost of building. It was quite a sacrifice they made, but I'm grateful they made it because I was educated in those buildings. And I would just say to our community, it is awfully easy to find fault. Dr. Cayley? Yeah, I just want to make a comment. Um, you know, personally, there have been many uh, board meetings um, that have, I would say, been um, in the past, not many, a couple that have been contentious and heated and uh, emotional. And uh, I just want to publicly apologize um, for the behavior that took place at ASB on my behalf. You know, I was raised, if you do something that you don't, that you regret afterwards, you always apologize for it. So um, I did hand the paper back and dropped it on the floor. Um, and I own that, and uh, I know I've had conversations with the board about that, but um, I think there is a lot of uh, anger about the past from a, a lot of people in our community, and I wasn't here then. Um, you know, so part of that frustration has to do with, you know, caring, you know, caring about the kids and caring about this board and knowing how how hard everyone in our school district is working to do what's right for kids. So publicly, I'm going to make that apology. So hopefully we can move on and move forward because that was wrong of me. Um, so I'll own my behavior. Thank you, Dr. Fadley. Um, any other comment this evening before we ask for a motion to adjourn? I just want to tell you, thank you, Dr. Fadley. I, I truly believe in apologies as well. Um, and I also always believe that in these types of situations, people will look for anything to be a distraction. And our goal up here is always to create as least amount of distractions as we possibly can, because all it does is distract from students and staff and from the community goal. Um, so thank you for that. And all we can do is move forward. Um, but again, that, that means all parties. Um, and we can only hold ourselves accountable to moving forward. So thank you guys for, again, everything you do, and thank you again. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Any other discussion? Okay, hearing nothing, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. 
We are adjourned at 8 p.m.